go ahead. All right, yes, we are recording this so we can uh, share it on the Global Aztec site for, for folks who are not able to join any of the info sessions. All right, uh, let me share my screen and I will start with the presentation. Okay, so this is the Indonesia Fieldwork Experience, and the overall uh, title of this project is People, Primates, and Forests. It's a mouthful, so my, my <laughs> People, Primates, and Forests Integrated Primatological and Ecological Research to Advance Human Primate Coexistence and Ecosystem Health in Indonesia. So again, I, I, I introduced myself earlier, but again, I'm I'm Erin Miley. Uh, I am um, the program leader of this uh, project. Um, my research is uh, focused on a field called ethnoparmatology. It's kind of a subfield of, of anthropology, which is concerned with looking at the ways in which people, uh, as well as other primates uh, interface in all sorts of different ways. And so this involves ways that they interface uh, ecologically. So for example, they may share, um, they may live in close proximity to one another. But we, I'm also as an anthropologist interested in the ways of the cultural interconnections. So what I mean by that is uh, the ways in which, for example, primates may figure prominently in religious mythology and folklore. And so a lot of my work um, encompasses uh, doing observations of primate behavior, but also uh, uh, doing ethnographic work with uh, human, human communities. I have been uh, conducting field-based uh, field research in Sulawesi, the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia for more than 20 years. So it's exciting for me to continue to be able to work there as well as to um, uh, bring uh, students to my field site. So I wanted to tell you a little bit of just kind of a, a program overview um, is essentially what this program is, is a six week uh, National Science Foundation funded program um, for students to participate in research on human primate coexistence and ecosystem health um, in Sulawesi, uh, Indonesia. And before I give a little bit more details about the program itself, I wanted to first remind you where Sulawesi is in the world. Um, so here you have um, what we're looking at here is the archipelago of Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is an island nation made up of thousands of islands and situated right here in the center of the archipelago is the interestingly shaped island of Sulawesi. And that's uh, where uh, the program will occur. Now, just a little bit of background about the National Science Foundation, just um, in case students aren't, aren't familiar with this. So National Science Foundation is federal funding, um, supports a, a diverse array of research in science and engineering. And this specific program for which I have funding for is called International Research Experiences for Students. And so for short, we call it the IRIS program. And as you can see here, um, essentially the, the the goal of the IRIS program is to support international research and research related activities for US students, ultimately, so that we can produce a cadre of diverse, globally engaged workforce with world class skills, right? That's kind of the objective here. Um, and so it's very much focused on the international component and also the ability for students to um, participate in uh, research and research related activities. So the way that the IRIS program works is that again, I as the program, so PI stands for um, principal investigator. So I am the US principal investigator. And so I applied for the funding um, but the critical component of the IRIS program is that the US students are recruited and trained by me, but they also will travel to the site, in, in this case to Indonesia, and conduct research under direct supervision, not only of me, but of a foreign mentor, right? And so that's a key component of this kind of exchange, right? Is that not only are you doing work research in an international setting, but you're working with people in that country. And so I wanted to introduce to you uh, 
at least on a slide, um, who the foreign mentor is, right? And so this is, um, his name is Ngakan Putu Oka, and I call him Oka, Fa Oka. And he is a professor uh, at Hassanuddin University, in, which is located in South Sulawesi. And he's also the head of the forest conservation program at Hassan, Hassanuddin University. And while I'm in the Department of Anthropology, he, his focus is forest ecology. So you can see here what some of his research interests are, tropical rainforest diversity, insect plant interactions, the impact of climate change on plant reproductive uh, phenology. So we essentially have been in collaboration for actually a number of years, almost 20 years. Um, and again, we bring uh, kind of distinct areas of, of expertise where there's a lot of overlap, right? So I'm trained as an anthropologist and a primatologist. He's trained as a forest ecologist and we merge our kind of skills and our knowledge and expertise together to advance research on um, the human primate interface. So this is about, and this is an image taken just from this past summer um, when uh, myself, Melissa and Jaden, another student, Pedro, um, were um, in Sulawesi this summer. Um, so it was great. I hadn't seen him in three years. So usually I go every year. So it was a long time to not, to, to not be able to collaborate. Okay, so I wanted to take a moment to kind of give you an overview of the research, of the overarching research um, proposed by this IRIS program, right? Again, it is integrated and interdisciplinary in the sense that I'm, that Paoka and I bring together different expertise, both from forest ecology and primatology to study how people, primates, and ecosystems interconnect and mutually affect one another. So if you look at this graphic here, it kind of gives you an overview of kind of what our research interests are, right? Humans are kind of up here. And of course, humans are engaged in lots of different activities um, that affect landscapes. So for example, agriculture, right? Agricultural development is a major force changing landscapes around the world, right? Another thing that, that humans do that affects uh, uh, primates is they, they like to feed them. <laughs> when they encounter them in different sites, whether they're tourist sites or um, other types of sites, um, they engage in what's called provisioning. And then of course we have climate change, which largely is a result of human activities. And all of these activities affect both tropical forests and wildlife within them, including primates. And so one of the things that we're interested in understanding is, okay, how do primates respond to these impacts, right? Are they able to be flexible in their behavior? Another thing that we're interested in is, okay, how does these kinds of human activities affect plant phenology, which basically means like the patterning of production of leaves and fruits and flowers, right? Over a kind of a season, right? How do these activities affect both tropical forests and primates? And what we know about primates, again, this is kind of my focus, is that oftentimes what ends up happening is that their foraging behavior, which is means how they travel across space to find food, becomes altered as they are impacted by humans and human activities. Sometimes that can result in crop feeding, right? So if, if a primate used to have a forest and all of a sudden there's agricultural land, there's no more forest, but maybe there's some crops for them to feed on. This can in turn lead to conflict between people and primates. It can also affect people's livelihoods if they're relying on those crops for their source of income, right? So all of these ultimately is about how do we manage these interfaces? How can we um, restore forests that are impacted by human activities? Um, and how can we mitigate uh, conflict between people and primates so that they can coexist uh, sustainably? So that's kind of the the, prod, the overarching project um, for the IRIS um, uh, pro overall pro project. And again, the goal is to fit students into um, this overarching plan. Now, which primates are we talking about? Well, specifically, are, we are focused on the moor macaque. And this is its uh, common name, moor macaque. And then this is its Latin or scientific name, uh, macaca maura. And here you can see um, this image here showing you how lovely they are. 
Um, and just to give you an idea, this is the island of Sulawesi here. And what one of the reasons why Sulawesi is so interesting um, and unique is that Sulawesi is the home to seven different macaque species. So you can see them all uh, shown here. And they are unique in the sense that they are found only on the island of Sulawesi. So they are what we call endemic to Sulawesi. So they are very special primates. And unfortunately though, um, at least two of them, including the more macaque are listed as endangered, right? So um, this is a classification developed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, that assigns a conservation status to um, all living things that are known about. In this case, the more macaque, so it's an endangered primate species. Okay, so within the broader overview that I just shared with you regarding the research, I have ideas already in place for possible mini projects that students selected for this program will be able to participate in. So one of the projects that we're gonna be working on is, is looking at the ways in which feeding the monkeys, right, provisioning, affects the monkeys' ecology and their behavior. And a lot of this um, happens, um, if you look at this image right here, this is also the image that you see behind me in the Zoom. Um, one of the scenarios that we're dealing with is that this is forested area, this is actually a national park, but as you can see from this image, there's a road that bisects it. And what we're finding is that more and more of these macaques are coming to the road where, they're, where they are seen by people passing by and they are fed. And so we're interested in trying to understand how this behavior affects the macaques and their long-term kind of viability in the national park. So that's gonna be one project um, that students can get plugged into. Another project that we're interested um, in advancing, uh, Paoka and I, is the role that more macaques play in seed dispersal and ultimately forest regeneration. So what this means is that we know that many primates are seed dispersers, right? Meaning that a lot of what they eat are fruits and those fruits have seeds. And through the behavior of how they handle those seeds, they often help the seeds get dispersed and help contribute to the regeneration of forests. And we know that macaques in general play an important role, but we actually don't have any data on the more macaques. And so one of the many projects that students are gonna be involved in is to observe the feeding behavior of the more macaques to see how they handle seeds. Are they consuming them? Are they chewing them and spitting them out, right? How are they handling the seeds? Because that behavior is gonna tell us a little bit more about the role they play in the seed dispersal and ultimately uh, regeneration of the forests. And then another project that students are gonna get plugged into, and this is kind of, this is particularly within the realm of Paoka's expertise, although he will be assisting with all of these, is the impact of climate change on plant phenology. And as I um, mentioned before, phenology just means kind of the, uh, the temporal or timing of the pattern, like when trees produce flowers and then fruits, right? Over the course of a given year or several years. And what we're seeing with some plant species is that with changing climate patterns, their phenology, which generally has a pattern, is getting disrupted. And you might think, oh, well, that also not only does that have implications for the plants, it has potential neg negative implications for wildlife that depend on those plants, right? Because primates know, oh, okay, this fig tree is gonna fruit at this time, right? But if that's getting impacted, that's gonna affect their, their food supply, right? So that's kind of the one of the emphases of that kind of project. So these are a couple of ideas um, and you'll see that ultimately if you're interested in applying, you'll see that um, I will be asking students to rank their interests um, of, of participation in these projects so I can start to assess where we can plug uh, some of the students uh, in. Okay, um, now I kind of want to move on to some logistics. So um, essentially what the travel will involve is traveling from San Diego uh, to um, the main island of um, Java, which is right here. And you can see here, I thought I had a little graphic. 
Oops. Yes, there. So it's not quite in the right spot, but that's okay. So this circle should be around Jakarta, which is right here. So the travel will be from San Diego through Tokyo, usually, um, and then landing in Jakarta, which is the capital city of Indonesia. And then from Jakarta, we will then uh, fly over here to Makassar, which is the capital city of um, South Sulawesi. So um, that's how we'll get to Sulawesi. And then once we're in Sulawesi, most of the transportation will involve kind of buses, hired cars, and then occasionally there will be some motorcycle trips, although you won't be required to drive the motorcycle, you just have to be a passenger. So don't worry, unless you like to drive but. Uh, so that's kind of how the travel will will take place. Um, Jakarta is a is a is a very large city, um, quite metropolitan in many ways. High high population. I think it's twenty six million people. So um, pretty populated, very dense. Um, this is a common uh, scenario when you're in Jakarta. It's packed all the time so it's a pretty busy city um but a but a but a, a fun place to visit for a couple of days so that's where we'll kind of situate ourselves and and try and get over jet lag a little bit before we head on to Sulawesi this is Makassar um again Sulawesi um, Makassar is is right on the coast uh Sulawesi so you'll see lots of boats and whatnot um and we'll spend a little bit of time in Makassar largely um well, actually, you'll, the students selected will be kind of go back and forth between Makassar and the field site, um, which is fairly close. It's about an hour and a half away um, um, because our my counterpart, Paoka, um, who's situated right here, there's there's myself and then you can see Jaden here and Melissa and then Pedro, who's the other student who joined. So this is um, my Indonesian uh, collaborators at Hasanuddin University or what short for UNHAS. And so students will be working with not only Paoka, but many of his students and other uh, uh, colleagues at the university. And you can see this is one of the programs we ran this past summer. So the field site um, is um, Bantimur, and this is a mouthful. So Bantimur Bulusarong National Park, um, which is again, approximately 50 kilometers from, from Unha. So, Figure what that is in miles, but a driving time, it's about an hour and a half or so. Um, it's the, the areas around it are, are, are certainly much more rural than what you see in Makassar. Um, so when you're in the field, um, this is what it's gonna be like as you um, travel through the forest and make observations, if, particularly if you're working with the, with the primates, conducting observations on um, their behavior. Um, and not only working with uh, myself and, and Paoka, but also um, employees of the National Park. So he, again, here's another image showing you, this is one of the groups of macaques that lives in the area and you can see them kind of hanging out on the road, right? So that's kind of showing you another, capturing another image of, of the current circumstances that we're seeing um, at this site. In addition to uh, the research, there's always going to be ample opportunity for some cultural and nature-based excursions. So one of the highlights of Bantimurung National Park is the waterfall that you can see pictured here, um, where you can go tubing and whatnot. Um, there's also a really fantastic archaeological park um, where you can witness uh, um, remains uh, um, from uh, humans that lived in Sulawesi approximately uh, 40,000 years ago uh, and look at the artwork that they created um, at this site. So that's a pretty, um, we had a chance to do that this past summer. And then there's another site which is quite lovely and that's called Ramang Ramang, um, which illustrates the beautiful limestone or what we call karst um, formations here. Um, and this, this gives you a chance to kind of walk around and this is a village, people live here at this area, but there's also um, a couple of cave sites here where there's also some evidence of, um, of um, archaic uh, uh, cave art, which is pretty cool as well. So housing, where will we, where will we stay? Um, so we will, when we're at the, when we're at the um, field site, um, we will stay in the village of Bengo. Uh, and, and that will entail either staying um, in, in a villager's home, 
um, or um, a research station area. And that's going to be that that's yet to be determined, um, but that'll be in place in time for our um, for our project. And this is one of the um, women who has hosted me for many years, Iwahaji, um, who hosted me for since I first started working at the site since 2010. So um, lots of fantastic um, friends and what I consider family um, living there, and they're always welcome, welcoming to my students and myself, um, and also a fantastic way to really get a feel for life in Indonesia. This is an aerial view of the of the town of Bengal. So just to kind of give you a sense of kind of what the landscape looks like. So it's again certainly much more rural compared to um, uh, Makassar, but there is electricity. Um, there's water. Sometimes there's um, um, electricity kind of brownouts, if you will. But um, but that's that's just comes with life in Indonesia. Uh, so um, but ultimately quite lovely place to be. Ah, the food. One of the best parts of Indonesia um, uh, is the food, in my opinion, and I think many others. Um, so lots of different interesting things uh, to eat. Um, my friends in Indonesia will say that if you have not eaten rice, you have not yet eaten. So rice is a huge part of the cuisine, in, um, and they have lots of different types of rice, um, not only varietals of rice, but also ways that they prepare rice. But usually a standard meal would be a lot of rice and then some type of protein um, and vegetable. Um, for students that um, are vegetarian and or vegan, there's lots of opportunities. So you're not kind of restricted. Um, they, there's a tofu and, and tempeh are widely sold and consumed and lots of fresh vegetables as well. So um, and there's also a lot of fish, particularly on the island of Sulawesi, and my students can attest to that. We, when we were in the city, we ate fish a lot. So if you are a fish eater and lover, then you are in luck. So this is kind of, oh yeah, speaking of fish, this is kind of a typical fare. Um, this is a filleted um, fish, is probably kakap, which is a uh, type of fish there. Um, and you can see uh, they fillet it. And then this is kind of very typical, it comes with a number of kind of sauces, some very spicy. So if you like spicy food, you're also in luck. And this is a very typical um, green called kangkung. It's, uh, you can actually find it here in the United States if you go to uh, Asian food store. Um, it's a uh, Chinese water spinach. Um, so super yummy and um, very easy to find over there. So very, very classic uh, a meal in Makassar. And if you have sweet twos, then you're also in luck because Indonesia is quite famous for all the different arrays of, of sweets that they produce. So this right here, um, interesting color combination, but this is called kue dadar. Um, essentially what you're looking at are little um, like crepes, you know, uh, probably made with rice flour because rice is, is the main ingredient for many kinds of breads and all those kinds of things. The green comes from pandan, which is a plant. And then the inside is basically rolled up and then in the inside is um, palm sugar and coconut. Yum. And then in, just in case it wasn't sweet enough, then they, they um, cover it in sweetened condensed milk. So lots of yummy things like that to consume. Okay, so um, just to wrap up, I just wanted to go over some of the kind of program requirements. Um, this is required by the fund. Well, some of these are required by the funder. Some of them are, are stipulations that, I, that we put in place. Um, the funder does require the, uh, the students to be US citizens, nationals, or permanent residents. Um, uh, and uh, the, again, they're, they're meant to be SDSU undergraduate students. So you have to be a current student. Um, with upper division standing and a minimum GPA of, of 3.0. Uh, expectations for the students. Um, ultimately, again, I'm, I'll, you know, there's very, there's only three slots or up to three slots for this program, so it's highly competitive. Um, and so there is an expectation that students have a strong interest in primatology or wildlife ecology, forest ecology, conservation, sustainability, something around, around those, those, you know, those, um, a number of those, of those areas. There is the expectation that students will attend five pre-departure sessions. So this is to prepare students for the upcoming summer travel. And that, those will all occur in spring 2023. 
I also expect do students to respect the social and cultural norms of Indonesia and, and be a, a, a global ambassador for not only for SDSU, but for the US more broadly. So that is, a, is an important expectation. And then lastly, on, on, this, on the return of the students, um, I will expect students to give presentations on research experiences, kind of a payback to the SDSU community, um, maybe help recruit future students. Um, but also one of the key goals of NSF, the National Science Foundation, is to um, communicate science to the broader public. And so one of the things I'll be expecting students to do is um, brainstorm with me and my other students on, on ways in which we can share um, uh, research and get students at K through 12 interested in science and research as well. So again, in, in terms of program preparation, um, this is a little different maybe than some of the other programs you may see on the Global Aztecs website. Um, you're not enrolling any courses while you're in Indonesia. Um, so there, there are no courses that you have to take during the summer. However, um, I do think it's, I do encourage students to take as much coursework that would be preparatory because that would really enhance the, you know, kind of their background knowledge before the summer experience. And so I've listed a few courses here. Um, it's not limited to this and certainly students can always reach out to me and ask further questions, but here are a number of courses that I think would prepare students um, for, for this experience. So for example, Melissa, um, Jaden, and Pedro, who joined this past summer, they had all taken Anthropology 355 with me, exploring primate behavior, um, which gave them a kind of a broad background on primate behavior, and so kind of set them up nicely for the experience. But there are a number of other courses that might suffice as well. So if you have any questions about that, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, and this is just a little bit of information about the pre-departure sessions, as I mentioned just a moment ago. I will expect students, so the students that are selected for the program to attend five, roughly two hour sessions that we'll schedule at a later date, essentially um, to introduce students to the program. And also my, my counterpart, um, Paoka, will join these sessions, um, introduction to Indonesia. Then we'll have a couple of sessions about the research themes, getting students prepared to participate in research and the methods, and then a broader session on kind of travel, logistics, and, and study abroad kinds of things. Okay, uh, importantly, funding. So as I mentioned, this is funded by the NSF, so students don't have to apply for funding for it. Um, they, by basically, I have the funding and then students will be covered as a result of that, the students who are selected. So the funding that I have in place will cover all of the transportation for students. So that includes international airfare. It includes domestic airfare within Indonesia to get from Jakarta to Makassar. Um, in all in-country transportation, like ground transportation, all housing, all food, uh, visas and permits. Um, students will also receive um, a weekly stipend um, of $600, and that will enable students to um, purchase on their own um, any required vaccinations. So there are a number of vaccinations that the CDC recommends um, for international travel to Indonesia, and I will certainly provide all that information for students selected. Also, SDSU does require students to enroll in um, travel insurance, um, and so and it's very reasonable. So that will be something that students can cover with, a, with their stipend. If students don't already have a passport, that could be another thing, um, although visas and permits will be covered by, by, my, by me. And then if you have any field gear, um, a lot of the equipment that we'll be using will be covered by me, but um, there may be additional field gear um, like clothing or, you know, um, things like that, mosquito nets, things like that, um, that you will be able to, to purchase on your own. And then can help offset, for example, um, you know, a lot of students I know work during the summer. So uh, um, earning a stipend will help kind of alleviate um, the fact that students, you know, will be abroad and not able to necessarily uh, be employed here back in the United States. And that's a key goal of the IRS is to offer these opportunities. So it's not financially um, difficult for students. And then just some passport and visa information. Um, my understanding is that it's the wait times for passport applications is still long. Um, so if you do not, if you are interested in applying for this program and you do not already have a passport, I encourage you to get on that ASAP. And of course there is a passport office here on campus uh, that can help facilitate that. 
And then once the selected students are, the students are selected, I will help facilitate the visas that you will um, get in order to enter Indonesia. And these are what we call sociocultural visas, which we will obtain at the embassy. There's an embassy of Indonesia up at the, actually it's a consulate, but whatever. There's a, up in that Los Angeles, there's a location. And then I think this is my last slide. Um, the application, um, there's still a number of months before it's due. It's not due until February 15th. Um, but essentially the application is going to ask you to answer a number of short answer questions um, and provide some background information. My advice to students interested in is to be as detailed as possible in your application because um, I can't predict how many applications we're going to get, but as I noted before, it's highly competitive and that there are very few slots. So the more detailed with more examples, um, of you know, kind of addressing the question prompt that you can give, that's going to make your application stronger. If you have any questions about the application, you're welcome to reach out. You could also always reach out to some of my students if they're willing to, to give their, their contact information um, for advice or whatever. But, but again, it, it, if it asks you for you know, to provide some detailed information, please don't hesitate to do that. That'll, that'll make your, your application stand out more. And then um, after I have a chance, along with a, a broader panel to review the applications, we then will be selecting a smaller subset of students for an interview, which will then help us decide on the final, the final three, if you will. And all that information is, is going to be available on the SUSU Aztecs Abroad page, which I believe probably many of you have seen already because that's probably how you found the link to this. So, um, so I think, oh yeah, and then last, sorry, one more because I know we're getting close to it and I wanted to make sure I had time for questions and whatnot. Um, but what are the program outcomes? Well, um, through this program, students will gain research skills in field primatology and tropical forest ecology that wouldn't necessarily have been um, um, able for you to do if you were just working in the US, right? That's a key part of the IRIS program is that you get experience in something um, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do here in the US. So this is a very unique experience in that sense is that you're working in a country where there's primates living and you're working um, at the kind of the, ed the cutting edge working on um, this human primate interface. Also another important outcome is um, students will develop and hone their skills in cross-cultural communication and effective teamwork in diverse settings. This is a, a transfer, these are transferable skills, meaning that they will assist you if you go on to do research, but they will assist you in all kind of future career opportunities that you may have ahead of you. So super important to, to build those kinds of skill sets. Also, another outcome that I hope will come through is that students will apply the knowledge and skills that they gain to help advance um, conservation efforts in the area and find ways to mitigate some of the conflicts that we're seeing between people and primates, both here in Indonesia, but also in other areas. And then ultimately to develop skills in communicating science. And this is communicating science not only to other scientists, for example, or other peers, um, but also to the, to the broader lay um, to, get to, to get people excited and interested um, and, um, and, and recognize the value and impact that science can have. Okay, finally, I'm done. Okay, so um, before we turn it over to questions, I just wanted to um, give um, Melissa and Jaden just a moment or two to just to say hi, and maybe you could share like a tip or like one of your favorite things or whatever about the experience. So, um, and then we'll open it up um, for questions from the, from the students who have joined us today. So Melissa, do you wanna go first? there. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, so it was a super, super exciting trip. Uh, for me, primatology is a recently discovered area. I just never had um, access to it before. So after taking Dr. Riley's uh, class of anthropology 355, exploring climate behavior, I was like, oh, wow, like this is this is something that's done out there. And we have our own Dr. Riley here in San Diego State. It's like, oh, it was very, very exciting. Um, so yes, uh, I can uh, set my email if anyone wants to ask um, any further questions or tips um, about the trip. Uh, but yes, for me, it was very, it was very elucidating uh, just how doing research happens 
And that's not something that I had seen before. So it certainly gave me uh, lots of hope and purpose on a career path for myself. Um, and I mean, and then you are traveling. So I don't know, I think if you are considering it or kind of like on the fence about it, you should totally go for it. I think if you feel like you might not have the qualifications or the preparation, I still think that you should go for it. And then you're still quite on, on time before applications to kind of cover some of the preparations that you think might be helpful. Um, so yes, it was a great trip. It was great uh, getting to know Dr. Riley and the two other students that we hadn't, uh, Pedro and Jaden, like we hadn't met before and we ended up having such a great time together. Um, so yes, I think you should totally go for it. Like everything was, was very special um, from an, a professional academic level to a personal level because you're traveling and personally I had never been that far nor in a country where I didn't speak the language so it was it was, it was a little bit anxious I guess in the beginning but everything was great and uh, just navigating the the whole scene with Dr. Riley was well it was made pretty pretty easy as well and and gave us a lot of confidence um, so yeah, I'll put my email in the chat. And if anyone has any questions, like I brought a huge bag and it was such a, <laughs> it was so problematic. So I can give you some tips on what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, and one thing I should note too is that um, for students here today, um, this is the first of three summers. So, so this program, I have funding for three sessions. So I, that's an important point I wanna make just in case you're maybe waffling about whether or not this summer is right for you, or if you um, are interested, but feel that you may need to get some more preparation, preparatory coursework under your belt, so to speak. Um, so I will be offering this same program summer 2023, 24 and 25. So just wanted to make sure that that was understood as well. All right, thanks, Melissa. Um, so, Jaden. Hi, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, if you're um, this trip, I don't know, I'm always like speechless when it comes to talk about it. Like we did so many things and I can't imagine if you're there for six weeks, how many more things you'll get to do. It was jam packed, but like in the best way possible. Also, I never got such good sleep than like being there. Like, I feel like especially in Halley Moon, like I had my best night's sleep there. And I'm like, right now I'm, it's dark because I'm in the Netherlands and I have not gotten that great of sleep here. <laughs> but no, it was a great trip. And I think like, uh, Melissa, I'll put my email in the comments if you want to reach out. But like she said, if you're wavering, might as well just look into it and apply because I would, if I found out I missed out on this past summer I would be like so mad at myself like I almost did I was second guessing it I just found primatology also and I was like is this something I'm ready for I kind of felt almost intimidated it seems like something you need to have a lot of baseline knowledge of and I'd at that point only taken uh Dr. Riley's class but no I think don't let it scare you I think it could be like the best experience ever um, but I do highly recommend taking Dr. Riley's class and uh, sustainability and culture. I took that one before we left. And I definitely think that gives you more the perspective of the people. It helps remind you that, yes, we're there for primates, but also the people as well, because they're very interconnected. And what you do for one affects the other. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. But yeah, and also if you do get accepted and you're looking at the packing requirements and there's a lot of edits in red, <laughs> that is because of us. <laughs> We had so much fun doing that, but <laughs> there is um, hopefully going into the summer, there'll be quite a few edits in that way. <laughs> you won't struggle with taxis and <laughs> the other things we did, <laughs> but no, I can't promote this more. It's, it was amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Jaden. All right. Um, well, we do have, um, I guess, about 15 minutes left. So um, I just want to I want to open it up to um, our participants. Maybe you're welcome to. Um, it looks like Grace. Hi, we can see you. If the others are able to or want to turn on their cameras so we can see you, that's great. If not, I, I, I can appreciate that as well. But you're also welcome to jump on and say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself since we only have, oh, I guess, like five people here. Um, and then if you have any questions, please go ahead. 
Also, I can stop the recording as well. If you would prefer to not be recorded as you're introducing yourself, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, that's a good idea, Letty. Thank sure. you.